Am I walking? Can you guys hear me? I'm actually waiting for somebody. There you are! Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, it worked instantly! Yeah, it did. <laughs> Wonderful. How are yeah. you? I'm good and you. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm so glad we finally got to do this. Yeah, so, I'm too. So yeah. today's topic, West Africa before European colonization, or for, before colonization in general, particularly mm -hmm. the Mali Empire. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, there are so many negative stereotypes attached to Western Africa. I can't. Mm -hmm. Like, Africa in general. Um, but I think the Mali Empire is a special case because it's like literally the oldest civilization in the world or one of the oldest and one of the like Africa, West Africa Timbuktu is the oldest university in the world right and I, um, I, think, I believe it's yeah, actually um, there's a difference of opinion because it really depends it depends what you define as a university as but uh, we do have obviously al qawar Karawiyan and Morocco that some say is the first continuously operating university in the world but Timbuktu is definitely one of the first in the world. It's definitely up there. Yeah. Mm. But I think it's also, if you, if you check who defines what. Yeah. Because, of course, if you look in, in Western education, then they wouldn't talk as good of Africa or about Africa as they should, because that would be like giving credit where the Western world thinks credit isn't due, you know? True. So what's really, what's really something that people don't even know about the Mali Empire? Yeah, so I'd say one thing that people generally tend to forget about the Malian Empire is, first of all, how it came to be, and also how sophisticated it actually was. Because not a lot of people actually consider, for example, the political machinery that was in place. And it was not just necessarily like the Mansa, because every, every time, you know, someone mentions, you know, Malian Empire, people just think Mansa Musa, right? People don't really mention the people that came before him, whether that was, you know, uh, Mansa Abu Bakari II, who has his own amazing story, or Mansa Sakura, who has his own special story as well. And people don't really know that the Malian Empire didn't just pop out of nowhere, but it was actually just it's something that came up as a, as a result of continuous, you know, migration from different peoples within that specific area, a lot of different conquests that were happening. At the same time, you know, there's the salt mines and the gold mines, which were extremely profitable, that actually made it possible for people to actually build this empire. Yeah. So literally, the Malian Empire was like, it was really an empire. That was not just a name. It was really an empire. It was literally a world power, wasn't it? Yeah, I'd say um, there's actually a historian by the name of Felipe Fernandez uh, Ernesto, and he actually mentions that in the 14th century that the Malian Empire was the richest state in the world at its time. And if you look at specific research that's been done, they find that half of the gold that you find in the old world or like, you know, everywhere except for, you know, South America and North America during those times, it was found in Mali. So this is exactly why you would see someone like Mansa Musa class as one of the richest men, if not the richest man in history. Because obviously that when one person possesses all that wealth, people don't really know that when they would do the gold mining, that all of that gold would actually go straight into the royal treasury. And the royal treasury was the you know the personal bank account of someone like Mansa Musa or the Mansa essentially. So that's why you find that all these Malian uh, emperors uh, were quite quite you know wealthy. So do you think that the, the kind of like trivialization or the not giving credit to the Malian Empire stands in representation of underdeveloping Africa in general? Yeah, I'd say so, because Africa has always been at the other end of this narrative of, you know, this idea of, oh, Africa has to be, you know, something that is primitive, has to be something that oh. is backwards or underdeveloped. And even uh, I'm, I'm studying colonialism, global political economy and uh, development. And even this concept of modernity and development, a lot of African scholars have come to challenge that because who gets to define what that is? 
right? But if we're talking about advancement and all these different things, even based on this Western conception of what it means to be truly advanced, I can name numerous African kingdoms that have made considerable, you know, a considerable dent in history in terms of like, you know, making their mark in history. The Malian Empire, I'd say for me, is one of those empires where you can't really ignore how far reaching, you know, the effects of that empire are even still today in terms of how different tribes got into to interact with each other, different lines of scholarship, which religion people practice today. All of that was, especially in West Africa, it's a really key political you know, empire that existed in the medieval times. Also, I think what, what Western education or the, the school system in, in the Western world absolutely fails to recognize and acknowledge is the fact that Europeans actually went to Mali to learn and to be taught in astrology and different types of um, scientists, right? They actually learned from there and later took their knowledge, the stolen knowledge, to Europe. Yeah, so the thing is, obviously you do have, I mean, in general, first of all, there's, a gen there's an agenda, especially uh, by Orientalists, to erase, first of all, not just African history, but non-Black history. So this includes, obviously, the Islamic Golden Age, which we know to have produced amazing, amazing minds. I'll just name a couple, like Al-Khawarizmi. There's also a couple of people like Hassan ibn Haytham. He's credited with coming up to the closest thing. Like he came up with the closest thing that we know to the scientific method. The first person to fly was actually, you know, someone who was not, black, like not white, right? Although non, uh, non-white, uh, like essentially they had their own specific, you know, experiments that they're doing. And obviously what do you go, when you go to like Western education, what do they tell you? That it was the right brothers that were the first to fly. But that's actually not true, yeah. right? But even when you come to Mali, for example, uh, and unfortunately we have this, is that some... Unfortunately, some uh, non-black, specifically, you know, people like, for example, Arab historians, some of them tend to look down on that history and they tend to really downplay the greatness of Timbuktu. I'll give an example. So we have some reports uh, from different sources that actually mentioned that there was a scholar that came from Mecca. And obviously, for those who are Muslim, right, you should know that this is the center of the Islamic world, right? Mecca and Medina. Those two cities are very important. And if you're studying there, you're studying amongst the greatest scholars, essentially. But what you had is that one of those scholars went to Timbuktu to be a student, but they were turned away and told to go to uh, the University of Al-Qarawiyin, which is in Morocco, to study for 10 years before they could even be a suitable student in Timbuktu. Another thing is that Leo Africanus, uh, he was another uh, traveler that came to the Malian Empire. What he actually found was that books were some of the highest traded commodities in and out of the Malian Empire. And obviously you have scholars like Ahmed Baba, who had libraries. He professed to have a library of over 1,600 books. And amongst his friends, he was the one that had the smallest library. Wow. Can you just imagine? That's amazing. Yeah. So what, what do you think is the biggest achievement or the biggest yeah, the biggest achievement of the Malian Empire to even today's human history. I mean, oh, that's a very difficult one because there are quite a few in my opinion. Uh, but I think the main thing is um, how they structured their civilization. Uh, it's, it's probably the first constitution that you're going to find, or one of the first constitutions you're going to find in Africa, came from the Malian Empire. It's called the Korokorn Foga, and it's around 30 to 40 articles of just general values. That in and of itself was the characteristics of one of those civilizations that's really come to grips with this idea of building a state. Another thing is obviously the management of resources and how they were able to manage that, etc. This idea of certain aspects of the kingdom or certain you know, areas of the kingdom having their own autonomy. So all that they had to do was essentially uh, pay certain tributes to the Mansa every single year to keep themselves within that kingdom, right? It's like taxes, so, right? Yeah, essentially taxes like that. But not even just that. It's like how they managed to bring 12 different ethnic groups together to live peacefully. under one kingdom. Yes, right? Peacefully, right? Something Although that the white man hasn't yeah. even achieved to today. <laughs> yeah. Let's not forget yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the idea that, you know, we, wow. we, we came, people came together after Sunjata Keita um, that's the founder of the Malian Empire, was able to actually, 
unites all these 12 different ethnic groups there's an automatic there's an uh, there's an automatic you know division of labor so some groups were told that you know you guys are going to be in charge of the security you guys are going to be in charge of the propagation of religion you guys are going to be in charge of taxes for example all these different things so even when it came to that lineage all these different things it was good the only issue was when it came to succession disputes there used to be issues where for example um you would conquer one city and then it was common place for you to uh, as a conqueror to take the son or that person that you've just you know you've conquered the 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 city and then you'd raise them up yourselves right mm-hmm. so it really that was one of the main issues that caused a lot of succession disputes sometimes there were actually like you know battles between sons cousins fighting for the throne of course, yeah yeah but obviously when it comes to like the state building of the malian empire i don't think i've come to see something like that even in many different african kingdoms i think that the malian empire was the best in terms of that in terms of south uh, africa south of the sahara Yeah. I also think that it's safe to say that the Malian Empire played a big role in today's uh, democracy or the way we are setting our states up in the western world today was actually rooted and done in the Malian Empire hundreds of years ago. So in terms of democracy it really depends um I'd say in terms of constitutional democracy that yeah. could be something because what you did is you had representatives from each tribe. So exactly. in terms of representative democracy that's what I would say but i wouldn't go as far as to say democracy you know as a whole if you want to look yeah. for an african society that did practice democracy you can look at the bosoto people in southern africa specifically under a king by the name of mashweshwe right he really focused on democracy but the malian empire was more of an idea of a uh, kingship right and that's something that you'd be able to to have uh, like you know you you basically hand the throne over to your son or your cousin etc all these different things but in terms of representative democracy all of these different tribes would actually send uh in people to like you know go and represent the tribes and say that hey this is what we want from the king so that's something that was definitely yeah it was very unique because it was a multi-ethnic empire and you don't necessarily find that in many different places that's most true, ethnic yeah. groups kept to themselves but this was a huge empire you know How many millions of people do you know how many millions of people were living in the Malian Empire or what how many millions of people the Malian Empire consisted of So I mean there's estimates it's a bit difficult because you know they didn't really have census back then uh yeah. but we do know that uh in Timbuktu the University of Timbuktu in the 14th century had around 25,000 students that's just the university right but estimates actually say and i got this from one of akala's uh, addresses i think the oxford union address so if you want to go and like look at that i really recommend it he mentioned uh, that historians actually place the size of the malian empire like the capital city timbuktu to be five times the size of london so scholars estimate it's around between 70 to 100,000 people were living in timbuktu in the 14th century wow. so even That's... compared to london london was so small compared to timbuktu that's massive Yeah. And I also think that's sense. a big a big um part of how how Africa is being kept small or being kept looked down on by the world is by continuously making it look small. Like mm. you can imagine for instance Germany now is Nigeria is three times the size of Germany. Three yeah. times and Germany is in my opinion is already like big, you know? Like if you want to go from one end of Germany to the other it will take you with the car maybe approximately like 10 hours so you can imagine the kind of size nigeria actually has but it's not something that we know you know it's not we don't know that africa is actually this big to literally fit all the western africa uh, the western countries into the continent of africa and still have space yeah no i mean that's it's it's quite interesting because i think what you're referring to is in the called makeda projections so what they used to do is that they used to actually they had to design the maps in such a way whereby if you you know you draw a line from one side to another and you're traveling with a ship for example it's easy to use a compass right just to be able to draw okay you know we're going from here to here right but that was something that was very relevant to that specific time i don't know why we still use those maps today in spite of all the different technology that we have right because we obviously know that the world looks very different compared to what those maps are showing like the democratic republic of congo for example it's almost the size of western europe 
you can fit France, you can fit Germany, all these different countries in there. Yeah. It's just very odd that they they want to somehow downplay the sizes of those countries, even though. Yeah. 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 I really wonder why we're still sticking with those maps. Yeah. So the downfall of the Malian Empire, was it Western invasion or colonization, slavery? Um, so here's, here's the thing. Uh, it was actually a combination of factors. Um, one of the main ones was actually the Songhai Empire, the rise of the Songhai Empire. It was a, an issue to do with, as I said, the different areas of the Malian Empire that were autonomous. Right, but also some didn't like paying certain taxes, and they said that okay, you know what, we prefer to have that self determination. And what you do have is that you have leaders, for example, like Sunni Ali. Sunni Ali brought up the Songhai Empire and managed to conquer a lot. He basically destroyed the Malian Empire, right? So he actually began to to conquer all these different places, and one of the places that he managed to conquer, Jene, right? So um, he conquered Jene. And uh, he made that one of his the main cities of the Songhai Empire. And from there, the Malian Empire sort of dwindled away, right? And as time went on, that's how those uh, the Moroccans actually came down. And then they destroyed the Songhai Empire as well. So uh, it's a combination of factors. But the societies that remained afterwards, right? Those ones were, uh, I'd say, the stronger ones you find in Nigeria. Like, for example, the Sokoto Caliphate came up much later. The Hausa states, all these different things. They came up much later, and those were the ones that were destroyed uh, by the colonizers. Yeah. Just like the Bini Wall or even the Ashanti Kingdom, all these things, they were destroyed by the colonizers. Yeah, yeah, essentially. So, so even... how long did the Malian Empire last in total? Like how many years or how many centuries? Or... Yeah, no, it's, it's a bit hard to put um, a number on it, right? Because obviously it depends when you actually define when it ended, right? Because obviously... There's the golden age of the Malian Empire, right? But I tell people this, right? In around 1236, right? That's when it was essentially, that's when you find the Korokon Foga, all these different things coming around. And uh, when you look at it, uh, from 1236 until at least the late 1300s, that's when you start to see that the Malian Empire was actually thriving. So the golden age, I can say confidently, of the Malian Empire lasted for at least 150, 200 years, right? This is where you have, like, you know, all these different cities under the governance of, you know, one specific kingship. And from there, that's where you actually have all these different trades, you know, the University of Timbuktu, the scholars were also there. All of these different things were inherited by later generations. Uh, but that's definitely when uh, you start to see, you know, the golden age coming towards an end. After 200 years, that's when it started to come to an end. But 200 yeah. years is a very, very long time. Extremely like long. Like the U.S. is, I think, 260 or 290 years old as of today, right? Something, 200 and something years old. I'm I think so. Old. Yeah, I think so. Something, something along those lines. I mean, someone in the comments is going to have to help us because I'm not really that struck. The in U.S. doesn't system. matter anyway. So yeah, it's okay. Really... <laughs> yeah. So what, what do you, uh, if, if you were to write a history book about the Malian Empire for a white school or for a white mm. country, what would you really want them to emphasize on, to look at, and to acknowledge, and to, uh, yeah, to, yeah, just to acknowledge. Yeah, so what, what I would like them to acknowledge um, specifically is, first of all, that Africa had its own form of civilizations, and they need to stop perpetuating this myth. And I've seen them sneak it into books. I've even studied certain books in my high school, right? And they've tried to sneak this in. Very, very, it's a very sly way of doing it. But they tried to, for example, when they're discussing things like colonization, all these different things, they tried to just dip it underneath and they, they tried to justify it in some way, shape or form. They make, they, they make the point, oh, but you know, colonialism did bring this and that, right? Let's forget about that because we know it's not true. It's Anything not true. that was left behind after colonialism, right, it was not meant for us Africans. Yeah. The main part of colonialism was not to bring civilization or whatever they defined as civilization it was extractionary it was mainly monetary benefit so that's the first thing a second thing even when it was we're doing exploitation black history, yeah essentially and then the second thing we need to stop doing when it comes to black history month we need to stop assuming that africa's history starts and ends when uh starts with slavery sorry and then it ends with the civil rights movement it doesn't that is one pixel of african history there's a wealth of African history 
that can even go maybe even 18,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago. Like this, this is how old we're actually looking at all these different, you know, cities coming up, all these different civilizations coming up. Some are even 40,000 years old, right? Like the first, the first mine in Africa, you can find that in Eswatini, I believe. It's called Nguanya Mine, right? That's 43,000 years old. That's a long time ago. The first ever drawing that we know of today, the earliest drawing of mankind, it's a hashtag actually. You can find that in the Blombos Cave in Cape Town. And that's around 83,000 years old. But this is the only the ones that are recorded or that are still kept, you know? What about those yes. that were destroyed by colonization, that were destroyed by invasion? Those, they are gone forever. And that's True. also why, that's, I, I believe that's also a part of, like they say, the Bini Wall was longer than the Chinese Wall. And we all know the Chinese Wall is gigantic, you know, it's mm. massive. So you can imagine if the Bini Wall was actually longer than the Chinese Wall, it would have been such an achievement. Now look at the white man coming to Africa, thinking they are going to civilize the people, coming to meet something that's already above civilization, that's already like an empire, a kingdom, you know. So you come there and you're like, what the hell am I going to do? I have to destroy those things to make those people look dumb as fuck, making them think that they need me, you know, and yeah. that's what white people still do today. That's so true and it's so unfortunate uh, that we're actually finding, for example, the Benin Wall, right, or just even the Benin Kingdom in general. They, what I find really ironic is that they'll call our people, uh, they'll, they'll call our people uncivilized, they'll call our arts uncivilized, they'll call our practices uncivilized, but then they'll put our arts in their museums. They will and make them go, bring cash. Yeah, the, the, they'll bring them cash, right? And then they start labels and then they bring black artists or African artists onto their labels to make African music and they listen to this music. But the moment it comes to giving our civilizations credit for the great things that they did, their mouths are shut, yeah. right? It's so, so sad, right? And this is why I'm telling people, even like I'm, uh, when I'm reading, for example, about you know, all these different uh, topics, um, I actually studied, you know, uh, the you know the relationship between slavery and the industrial revolution and you know how the oppression of uh, Africans specifically black Africans actually helped to build Europe but you have people in scholarship even till today you can sense that there's a bias in their work and when I'm speaking to my professor about it they're even shocked that people can even publish research like that and claim that they don't have bias right it makes no sense whatsoever. Absolutely not. Right? Also, so, yeah. the, the fact that they are actually white people teaching Africanism or African studies in white countries, in white European universities to white students is what I would never, I would never okay. It's never, it can never be okay. It can absolutely never be right. Yeah. Now, here's what I tell people about teaching that history. Because the thing is, it's not the same as an African teacher teaching about European history because the oppression meter doesn't swing that way, right? It does not swing in favor of the African, right? So when you have a white teacher teaching African history to white students specifically, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, right? But you also have to be careful because you obviously have bias, you have bias. Yes. Right, And the thing is, even I've heard people tell me that in their classrooms, they'll bring up certain facts and the teacher will invalidate them because they just simply don't believe it to be true. Like, for example, if I tell you, right, that in Africa, specifically the kingdom of Bunyoro Kitara, right, I was rereading this paper again, they were doing C-sections before colonization Long and before. without having access to any other civilizations. When you, when you read those research papers, they actually say that it's impossible for the people of Bunyoro Kitara to have come up with their own version of a C-section. It's not possible. They could not have copied it, right? They came up with it for themselves. And what's even more interesting is that the people of Bunyoro Kitara, this is in East Africa now, specifically Uganda, they also vaccinated their children from syphilis, right? And this is a civilization that they claim to be primitive. Do you see how counterintuitive it is? Yeah. Right? And that's why, I, I mean, you know, I think everybody's entitled to their opinion. But to me, like you said, 
once you're a white person, you are born with bias. You are born with um, inherited racism. You are born with having certain stereotypes put into your brain right from the day you breathe the first breath on air. That, that, that's it, you know, it's not, it can never be otherwise. You cannot be not racist or not biased in a country or in a, in a society that's biased and racist. Yes. That doesn't work, you know. So that's why, in my opinion, white people shouldn't be teaching black history. And t talking about Africa is always black history. So we shouldn't have, even if you are African or if you claim to be African as a white person, um, you should still not be teaching African history because there are so many things that happened before white people even existed on planet Earth, you know? Like white people have only been here for like 8,000 years. And that's when Africa's history was already like, so flourishing you know so how do you talk about something that you claim to be just because you were born on african soil but you don't claim africa as your heritage because you don't give the credit that it deserves you know so that's why that should absolutely never happen in my opinion though but mm. we see where this takes you now somebody like you is sitting in his classroom and you know very well that that white person there is talking bull crap and then you tell them that you don't and the next thing that happens is gaslighting is tone policing is yeah racism, yeah you know you know actually i'll bring up the point here's what i think the only point of difference for me is that um i think world history is also one of those things whereby i don't want to necessarily go into the point where i'm like you know if you're not from a culture you can't speak on something but what i'd say is you have to be and this one thing you have to be in contact with black scholars or people for scholars from those areas otherwise you're disrespecting their culture imagine writing about english history when you're only referencing french and german scholars Makes that no is sense. poor scholarship that is not scholarship it is a misconstruction of what English history is. So now people would obviously be there like, oh no, that's atrocious. Why are you doing that? So let me ask those people, why is it that when you write your history books, when you write all these different things, the only names that I find there are the names of white men, right? Where are the African people in those stories? Have you not visited those ethnic groups or do you just not value the vocal tradition? I mean, the oral tradition, you know? Yeah. All these different things. And that's why I'm saying that it's so important in a world that doesn't favor the African, even in the, the world of scholarship, it is so important for us to take our place in that narrative. We need to take hold of our narrative. It, is, it has gone beyond that point whereby if Africans do not take charge or take control of their narrative, you will not have a say in what your narrative will be on the world stage, period. Yeah. Even I was watching an anime just the other day, right? Uh, it's about an African, actually. Right, that the, the first and uh, I think one of the only few uh, black samurais to ever exist. But even the writer of that anime was not an African, right? It was a white man, <laughs> white European, white American man. And this is the issue, right? I'm not saying don't make those things, but it is it's arrogant and it is ignorant for you not to go to the main source of knowledge Absolutely. and be and humble yourself and yeah. ask questions to them. Don't ask them to confirm, ask them to learn, right? Because they have the, the, the knowledge straight from the horse's mouth, you yeah. know? Yeah. And that's also, I think that's also what happened in the case of the Malian Empire, that it was literally white people that wrote that history mm. and also rewrote the history and whitewashed the history. Because if it wasn't the case, we knew that the Malian Empire lasted as long as America even exists, exists today. But we don't know all these things. Like, nobody even talks about the Malian Empire in our history books, you know? Like, we are not being taught that Europeans went to Mali, went to uh, Kemet, went to Kush to go and get those, that knowledge that they later brought to Europe. We are not even taught that the more civilized Spain and ruled in Spain for 700 years, you know? We are not taught all these things. Because to give black people the credit white people don't want black people to have. That's yeah. Important. Yeah. So even uh, what's very interesting about that is like a lot of people would be very skeptical. But there's actually, and this is one thing, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, I'm an expert in like this part of research, you know. But this is one thing I highly suggest people look into, right. Um, some, many West African tribes actually claim to have descended from Kemet, right or at least they, they, they claim some relationship in terms of religion, etc. So people have examined 
the different relationships that people have, like in terms of West African ethnic groups, they have with Kemet. So that's still ongoing research. And like, I don't feel like I'm in the space to comment authoritatively on that, right? But even what you just mentioned, right? So what's very interesting about Malian history is that, and this is the saddest thing, right? And this one, we can only blame African leaders for this, right? Or not necessarily just them, but the entire underdevelopment of Africa has put us in a position whereby there are 700,000 manuscripts estimated by National Geographic to be in Timbuktu today. But till today, we have not been able to decode majority of them. Why? Not because of lack of effort or lack of time. Simple answer, no money. Wow. Imagine if we were to go and spend money. The only country that has donated is South Africa. They've donated $10 million to this, uh, to this process of actually trying to decode those texts. So the thing is, it's not like you don't have people who don't understand Ajami, which is the, the text that they were, the, the, essentially the syllabi that they were using to write these books, right? But we just don't have people that are spending money on trying to decode those manuscripts. How much African history is sitting there getting, actually, wasted. to be honest, yeah, wasted. And you know that, you know, paper is something that can rot over time. It can easily just become, you know, bad. It can become very dry. It can even break apart. If yeah. it's not being preserved properly, our history is falling, literally like falling through our fingers right yeah. before our eyes, you know? And nothing is being done about it. Exactly. But, you know, I also think that the money part has, is again, I, I mean, I don't want to play the blame game, okay? No, but, you're right. I mean, we cannot talk about a problem without facing the root of the problem. True. And if we're talking about poverty in Africa, the root of the problem is still the white man, it's exploitation and underdevelopment of the African continent. True. Because without the exploitation, you know, with fair trade, with um, all this neocolonization and the contracts that come along with independence, that poverty wouldn't be the way it is. And there would be money to know about that knowledge. So what would the white man do? They wouldn't tell you, don't go and look at that knowledge. They will make you poor so that you don't even have the mind to look at that knowledge because there's mm. no money. So mm. it all comes back to exploitation and colonization and the inv invasion of the white man. So, but That's what good. I want to ask is, you know, when you're like, oh, you know, Africans have to like kind of be in charge of their own narrative. Then I'm like, I mean, that makes absolute sense because of course I'm kind of responsible for what people look at me as, right? If I'm a quiet person, people will receive me as a quiet person. But if I'm a loud person, you know, you get it, right? Yeah. But in I think in Africa's case is, it's not even asking white people for a part of the, on the table, for a seat on the table, but rather to build their own table. Because yeah. we've seen through history, white people don't want Africans on their table when it comes to equi equity and respect, you know, and being seen as basic human rights and all these things. Africans have always been treated as less, black people in general, you know. So I'm, I'm like, I think the narrative of Africa is all in the hands of whitewashed humanity and whitewashed beauty standards and whitewashed um, knowledge and all these things. So, well, how can we change that? How can this be changed? I mean, on one side, I, I, I don't want to look at black people and be like, oh, you guys, go and change the narrative when the narrative forced on them was built by the white man. So shouldn't the white man be the one changing the narrative that is forcing, that, is, that they are forcing on Africans? Yeah, so it's a very good question. <clears throat> but I'll tell you how deep the problem actually is. And I was reading an essay, uh, an article yesterday about the politics of knowledge. And what they said is that we're going to a stage whereby we're actually starting to wake up and realize that everything, even, the, even academia, is rooted in white supremacy and white domination. Because it's like you imagine this, right? White people came together and they created their own methodologies in subjects like history, even subjects in like, you know, social sciences, all these different subjects, they were rooted in these European enlightenment, in quotes, enlightenment ideologies, right? So even then, when it comes to us trying to change the narrative, we have to fundamentally demolish, yeah, demolish, sorry, demolish 
the fundamentals of all of these different subjects. And we have to look at it from our own lens. We need to be critical of the roots, the very roots of that, you know, this major problem that we're facing. Then the second thing, there are currently people who have knowledge out there, but they're underappreciated and they just, people just don't know about them. But we need to make it our priority to give these people platforms. And we need to make it a priority to get their works online, to get their works distributed within schools. It needs to be a multilateral um, multilateral, you know, a movement where you have people from different governments essentially sharing that knowledge to all these different communities, right? But unfortunately, even, even when it comes to us, right, we need to have that appetite for it. We need to get people, whether it's from the diaspora, it's not even about nationality now. It's about where's the knowledge, yeah. right? Because it's a matter of just collecting knowledge now. It's about getting people to do whenever you can archaeological research, right? Can archaeological research being done in this area or this area, right? Because right now we only have a couple of places, right, outside of Egypt where you've been, uh, where you see people doing archaeological research. There's no, I don't think there's any place that's been excavated as much as, you know, ancient Egypt, right? That's good, right? Obviously we have ancient Egypt, we have all the different things, but even that was rooted in this white supremacist idea that, oh, all Egyptians were, must have been white. All of them must have been white. Even though we know, we know not all of them are black, but not all of them are white either. None of right? them were white. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, as far as I'm concerned, there was not one single Egyptian that was white. As white yeah, but, but, yeah but by those European standards of, oh, you know, you have the, these, uh, these blue eyes. But no, no, of course not. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, no, of no, course no, no, no. not. Right? No. We're talking about Africans. And the most that you can say is that uh, some people obviously, some historians argue that they came from the Levant and those mixtures of obviously invasions upwards, invasion downward. But what do we know? They were a mixed society and some of them were black. Many of them were black. Yeah, many right? of them. Were many of them were dark skinned. Many of them were also lighter skinned, right? And they're the ancestors of the modern day cops that we know today, right? So it's, it's quite sad <laughs> that because of that ideology, that racist ideology, even places like, uh, you know, uh, Zimbabwe, for example, right? Numerous civilizations built in stone, complex societies. They have no one going to do archaeological research to the extent that they're doing it in Egypt. It's unfortunate. Could it be because it's not a point of interest? Because, of course, you cannot claim Zimbabwe as white the way you could have claimed or the way we could actually, the way we actually claimed um egypt as white because that's what we did we whitewashed the whole of north africa actually but egypt in particularly and i don't think it's a coincidence that we took egypt because egypt had such a rich well-documented history and we're like yeah that that was us you know we were not like this were black people that did that so i think it was very easy for us to whitewash egypt but it's not as easy to whitewash zimbabwe so i think <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a very good point. But you know what's surprising? Let me just tell you, actually, let me go through a couple of examples. And let me introduce all of you guys and listen very clearly. Okay. These white historians, some of them, they, they do not know where to finish. Like, they don't know where to end. For them, it is their job to whitewash everything. Yeah. Right? And let me just tell you one thing. Right? When you go to someone like, for example, Great Zimbabwe, there's a German... Uh, explorer i call him explorer right traveler right it's called great zimbabwe uh, uh, plantation official right it's a civilization right so it's called great zimbabwe they have the stone structures this guy called karl mauch in 1891 went there and claimed that it was biblical characters that built that organ that that civilization i know that it's like how because he's a german this? yeah i know he, i know yeah so like he claimed that it was actually the Queen of Sheba, right? And in the, under that paradigm, <laughs> right? That's not even the end, job. right? That's not even where it finishes, right? Let's go to the, the, the states, uh, the Swahili states on East Africa's coast for the longest time. And it's so sad, it's so ridiculous that this was even a respected scholarly position in history. Even scholars today, they, they say that it was, a, it, was, it was a problem, you know? They're shocked that they even, uh, you know, came up with such nonsense. They claimed, right, 
that the Arabs came and created colonies in East Africa, and that's how the Swahili states came about. But that's false. The Swahili states are a mixture of culture, right? And if you look at a paper by Lyndon Harris that talks about the, the social cultural experience of the Swahilis throughout history, what do you actually say? You, they actually say that it was the Arabs that were Africanized, not the Africans that were Arabized. That is the right? point. That is the point. The whole of North Africa, they are not, North Africans are not Arabs. That's such yeah, a the, yeah. misconception. When I hear Tunisians, Moroccanians, Algerians, Egyptians be like, we are Arab, I'm like, why would you claim your colonizer's identity for yourself that literally brought nothing good to your people? Like no single Arab, no single European Osman invasion ever brought anything good to Africa in general. So I'm, yeah. I'm just like, I'm just my honestly. But what yeah. you said about um, biblical characters building um, Great Zimbabwe, they took that bullshit technology or that thinking and brought it to Europe and said that is how the pyramids happen. Because they rather claimed it on aliens than saying black people built the pyramids. Because white people can't wrap their head around the fact that white and black people built empires and ruled the world while we literally didn't even exist. So Yeah. Yeah, no, so that's actually quick. Uh, a comment, right? Uh, specifically on the Arab expansion. But here's the thing, right? I want us to also just differentiate, right? Between what I called new colonialism and those yeah. old, old, obviously old empire, right? Because um, I tell people that, especially when it came to like old empire, Africans did that too. So even when we talk about the Malian empire, the Malian empire was expanding, <laughs> right? Yeah. And when it comes to the Arab invasion specifically, it's important to also note the history behind it. So obviously the Arabs when uh, fighting the Sassanids, right? Uh, this is obviously because of previous tensions that were there, right? But also at the same time, Arabs had already fought with the Romans. And unfortunately, the Romans, uh, the entire Byzantine Empire stretched from all the way from uh, what's called uh, Constantinople, all the way till uh, Tunisia, or what we know as Carthage, right? So obviously when Arabs came, right, they've already fought this empire because of previous beef, right? Obviously, there's still aspects of the empire trying to expand into Arab nations, etc. So when it comes to like, uh, what I tell people is like, you know, be very wary about different elements of history, right? Because I wouldn't necessarily say that, for example, the Malians were colonizers in the same way that the Europeans were colonizers, even no, though were both were expansionist, right? So even the same thing applies, for example, in my view, to the Arabs, Romans, Sassanids, uh, even the Greeks and the Romans, right? When it came to the sp specific time periods, because there was no borders. But what's the issue with European col colonialism? The issue with European colonialism is Africans were doing nothing. <laughs> we did not harm you. <laughs> there was no yeah. previous beef, right? Yeah, you saw good. resources and you killed our people. You enslaved our people. You raped yeah. our women, right? You came into our houses and you burned them down. Le right? European invasion was all about economics and new colonization is still all about economics, about finances, about power, about world power, about oppression. It's all about painting yourself as a savior while you're literally the root of the problem globally. You know, to, to say it as it is, I mean, it is what it is. So, so but yeah, of course, Arab, uh, Arab invasion was, was different than European invasion, of course it was. But at the same time, claim, not, uh, Africans claiming um, Arab, yeah. that's, uh, that's Arab the as their heritage yeah. is still crappy. Still yeah, you know, crappy, actually, like... yeah, I've actually done a podcast uh, with a North African, uh, he's Amazigh, right? So uh, he's someone yeah, that's, uh, you know, part of the native population there. And uh, what he's actually mentioning is that there's definitely people who did have elements of, for example, you know, Arab people intermarried, right, with uh, natives. However, and this is a big however, you cannot negate at the same time the vast majority of native blood that's there, right? Because yeah. all these different people, in spite of, for example, the uh, people from uh, obviously coming from the Assyrian Empire all the way uh, to Carthage, setting up on the north, to the Romans then coming down, or the Greeks coming down, etc. All that, all those different dynamics, right? 
sure, it did create different ethnic groups, but you can't negate the native blood, which was there from the beginning, right? It so has always been there. That's the point. Yeah. I, don't, I find it very weird for someone, uh, even from Egypt, to be like, oh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm someone who's like, you know, Arab, right? At least I understand you're closer, right? But it's obviously, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit odd, right? Given the relationship that Egypt has had with different, uh, you know, nations that are south of the Sahara, and at the same time, also uh, native people from North Africa. I would still find it very difficult, but as well, that's a topic I'm still doing research into, so I'm still going to find out more. Yeah, there's still there's so much undiscovered history that still, like you said earlier, that's still hidden, and that might, it's it's so painful to even say that might never even be brought to light. And that, but what can really be done about that? I mean, what can really be done about Africa's liberation? You know, in mm. general, black people's. I mean, of course, black people are their own liberation. That should be very clear. I mean, there should never be something like a white saviorism bullshit, you know, because we all know white people have no brought, brought no good to Africa. That's not a secret anymore. But at the same time, I think that the liberation of the motherland goes both ways. It has to go with the acknowledgement of mistakes and whitewashing of history by white people, by Western countries. And it has to go with the unity of Africans from north to south, from east to west, you know, unconditional unity without borders in the Idia case, even without different currencies, because they still are implied by the west, you know, I mean, that's why I very much love Gaddafi's idea of Africa being a United Nations of Africa, you know. Yeah, here's the thing, right? Um, I've discussed Pan-Africanism, I think I have a podcast on Pan-Africanism. Obviously, my views are still changing on the topic. Uh, but when it comes to obviously united Africa, right? Um, I'd say it's it's really it's a complex one, right? Uh, because, and this is what I tell people, right? The biggest issue is that we've come to accept what's called the nation state, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that I am Kenyan now, as opposed to being a part of an ethnic group, right? Meanwhile, in Europe, what happened? Even the German unification, right? Um, or even when it comes to, you know, Austria, Hungary, etc. Like, you know, all those different relationships between empires, right? They were based on culture, right? A, the, a lot of the European borders, if not all, were based on language, culture, religion. Yeah. But what were African borders based on? Arbitrary lines drawn like this, 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 by the white man in... Uh, 1884, uh, I believe it was, right? Yeah, the Berlin, Berlin Conference. Conference. Yeah, Germany hosted yeah. it once again, yeah. <laughs> a point of being ashamed to be German. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, really, it's really, really crazy. But in terms of, if you would ask me my personal opinion, especially about borders, from my experience studying the Malian Empire, they dealt with 12 ethnic groups, right? And that was a challenge, right? Yeah. So what I would think is that I would love if there were no borders at all, right? But I would love if Africans could just, go, like, you know, go into specific ethnic groups and then just be like, you know, this is what we want to do for ourselves, right? But what we have to do for now, obviously, because we can't just get rid of borders, right? Because I think that the arbitrary, the causing wars, the causing ethnic groups to fight, etc. It's yeah. arbitrary. It makes no sense, right? But what I would suggest is not necessarily that Africa becomes a country because of all the different legal uh, jurisdictions, the, even the different currencies. I mean, Africa is a huge continent. Right, because you've yeah. told me that even the DRC is bigger than Western Europe, right? So when it comes to actually making it a whole country, I think that would be quite difficult, right? I wouldn't necessarily like say I'm in support of that, but what I would say, and this is one thing we need to keep in mind, it's not just on an African perspective. All the colonized nations, they need to come together in order to create what I call and what scholars call a new international economic order, because what happened after colonialism? Colonialism put countries that were colonized into a position whereby there was no industry. Why was there no industry? Because all you're doing is focusing on getting these Africans, paying them peanuts, right? And sometimes even just making them, like, you know, paying them uh, with food that was not even enough to last them a day, right? And telling them to do this work for you, taking all the raw materials and then shipping it back to the mother country. And then after that, you're producing it, manufacturing it. You sell it to the Africans at 10 times the price. Till today, that is happening. 
And what's wrong is that we received political independence on a national scale. But on an international scale, no. there is no such thing as political or economic independence for colonized nations. No, there is not. I, I don't think that, Afri uh, that Gaddafi aims towards um, Africa being a country. I, I think he more looked at it like it is in Europe. Oh, yeah. Know, because Europe is a continent. And of course, as a German citizen, I can travel all over Europe without a visa. How yeah. can you, as an African, need a visa on your own soil because the white yeah. man said so? This drives me insane. Yes. Like a Nigerian, okay, now that they have ECOWAS, they can travel around uh, West Africa um, without, without visa. But how can a Nigerian want to go to Kenya and he needs a visa? So, or yeah, the, vice versa, you know? Yeah. That's not right. And it's the white man that said that, you know? And this is what I mean by normally there shouldn't be borders. When I mean borders for outsiders, but not borders for Africans. How can yeah. you have a border within on your own ground? That can never be right, you know? But yeah. there are so many, I, I think there are so many problems to be focused on, but everything starts with acknowledgement. Because as long as the Western world does not acknowledge their mistake and their ongoing exploitation, that hi uh, hierarchy, hierarchy will never fall. It is never going to be equal. Because yeah. white people still think they are here and black people are somewhere here, which is total rubbish, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the good news is actually they've, um, they've recently put something into effect called the, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, which is something that's been proposed by the AU and essentially means that you don't necessarily need work permits. If you're an African going to work, let's say, in South Africa and I'm a Kenyan, I can go there and work and I don't need a work permit. I can start a business there. I don't need a specific permit. Another thing is also about reducing the borders right, in terms of Africans. The main goal of that continental free trade agreement as well is to have virtually no borders. So also what another thing that it's doing is by creating a free trade agreement between all these different countries means that there's no tariffs, like, or like basically very low tariffs if there's going to be any. So that means that Africans good, African goods are going to be going around the continent because the issue is that intra-African trade, trade between African countries in around 2018, 2017, that period, was 2% compared to Europe, which is a smaller, obviously a smaller continent, and they were up to 70, 80%. So now imagine, obviously that is partly due to colonialism, but this is something that's very good. It's gonna help us out a lot, but it depends on how our governments are gonna put it into practice in the next 10 years. That's true. Somebody is asking about China business these days. For that one, we are going Ooh. to make another video about it all together. Because China's case in Africa is is different altogether. Than yeah. China. I mean, it's bad. It's always bad if invaders come to Africa. Yeah. But China's case is is different altogether. So when you're looking at the Malian Empire, and what is left of the Malian Empire today? It's it's unfortunate. It's quite heartbreaking uh, because what you find if you go to Timbuktu today is unfortunately it's it's you'll find them the first of all you find the mosque right of Timbuktu with the University of Sankore I believe a lot of those buildings are, buildings are still standing today which is good right you also find the the tomb of Askia Mohammed still standing over there as well uh but in terms of is Timbuktu the same or as great as it was back then nowhere even close Unfortunately, it is a low-income area. So even the people there, like, there's a lot of beggars on the streets. And it's like, obviously, this is, part, this is mainly like uh, this due to colonialism, and not just colonialism, but neocolonialism, IMF policies, right? Especially structural adjustment programs and bad leadership. All those combined things, right? Have made Mali as the country, right? That we know today have those issues. And keep in mind that the, the Malian Empire stretched from Mali to other different countries, right? Uh, and it's much, much bigger as we know it today, right? But in terms of like, what exactly uh, we should do uh, in terms of, you know, the, uh, the city of Timbuktu, I wish there could be a restoration process. I wish that they do could be Do you think some... it's possible? I think it's, it's possible. I mean, I just tell people that history is always rewriting itself. And like, keep in mind that uh, 
at one point, you know, Europe, you know, we've mentioned like the parts of Europe that didn't have any of that knowledge. And, it, you know, it was people, the Almoravids and the Almohads that had to bring that knowledge up to uh, the Iberian Peninsula. At the same time, also keep in mind, I'll give people this example. When you go to places like Baghdad, um, in Iraq specifically, right, that was also just a usual village. And then also uh, during the Islamic Golden Age, that's something that came up out of nowhere. So there's always time. But people need to keep remembering, this might not happen in our generation. I doubt it will. But you have to lay down the foundation for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation to build upon it. Because even the Malian Empire, it was not going to be possible. Sunjata Keita was the trigger. But before him, there were several players in place that would allow that Malian Empire to come together in the first place. And just as Sunjata Keita was the trigger for the start of the Malian Empire, right after Mansa Musa, things in the Malian Empire started to go down. And I've actually just looked up the date specifically, right? But it says over here, like, you know, in the 1400s, that's when it started to lose its borders, right? In the 1500s, the Songhai Empire came to power, as I mentioned, uh, Sunni Ali invading aspects of the, the Malian Empire, uh, parts of the Malian Empire, sorry. And then also in 1610, the last Mansa, uh, he was Mahmud uh, IV, right? He's the last Mansa of the Malian Empire. Um, that was in 1610, and that's when the Malian Empire, as we know it, came to an end. So, so it's safe to say from 1200 to 1610. Yeah, yeah, basically. That's a long time. A but there's even one that's time. longer, by the way. We'll, we'll talk about it next time, God willing. Um, I mean, but still, we, this needs to be in our history books. This needs to be common knowledge. We talk yeah. so much about the Romans and the Greeks and whatnot. What in the world concerns me with the Greeks, you know? There is no justification for a German history book to talk more about the Greeks than to talk more about Africans. Because the Greeks came after Africans already developed and were thriving and flourishing. So why are we talking about something that came after this one happened? Because that one is white and that one mm. is have to give credit to. And it's plain yeah. racism. That is, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, even we're just getting some comments here as well, asking if we're blaming Europe too much. I mean, this is what I'll, this is what I'll tell you. Um, it's important for us to obviously be balanced. We have to accept, yes, leadership does play a role, right? And I'm not saying that um, Africa would uh, be, in, uh, be in a worse place or, you know, be at the same place if we didn't have better leaders. Of course, things would be better. But the structural issues till today, even if you have the best leaders in the world, right? If Africa produced the best leaders in the world, still, there are structural issues that we have inherited from colonialism, like a lack of industry, right? And all these different organizations like the IMF and the World Bank have inbuilt neocolonialism into them. Even these structural adjustment programs, they're basically, it's, a, oh, it's an excuse to say, hey, we want to dictate your laws, your financial policy, your fiscal policy as Europeans because we know better than you, right? And they put Africans into this perpetual debt trap that leaves us at a place whereby they tell us to devalue our currency, right? Then eventually the prices, um, the local prices go up, but the international prices relative are going to be going down, right? So it's going to be cheaper for them to buy our own raw materials, manufacture them, and sell it back to us, right? At 10 times the price. That is the reality of the, the modern day uh, in, in Africa. That's basically what it is. And it's from my studies, right? And I'm going to be looking into this topic specifically um, uh, as part of possibly my research over the summer. And if you guys want me to do more, I'll definitely do more YouTube videos on that. Uh, yes, but really. that's the main thing. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, um, people ask me this a lot. Actually, even black people ask me this a lot. Why are you always blaming your fellow white people? Mm. Because, because my fellow white people are the root of the problem. I am not saying that African leaders are innocent. But point one, it is not my place 
to um, blame an African leader because it's very much my place to know that that African leader is only there because the Western world puts him in power. True. You know, True. so it's very much my place to blame my own people when my own people still refuse to acknowledge what we have been doing for the last 600 years. And it's very much to say a big, it's a big problem in my opinion to say, oh, um, but Africans are at fault too. If mm. you are invaded today, somebody comes to your house and rapes you and tortures you and oppresses you, continues with your children, you see your grandchildren suffering, your grandchildren will see their grandchildren suffering. You are not going to stand up to that person. It is not going to happen because you know that that person is of evil nature. You know that that person is the devil in person and you are not going to dare to stand up to that person. So it needs knowledge for Africans to know that the white man ain't shit. I'm sorry to say this, to use this language, but it is what it is. And unfortunately, it takes a white person to tell other white people that we are the problem. And unfortunately, sometimes black people rather listen to a white person, which is still rooted in white supremacy. You know, mm. it's still rooted in the thinking of white is better because white colonizes, uh, civilized us and all that bullshit, you know? It still roots in the same problems that we are trying to correct or we are trying to do better in future. And it ends and starts and continues with white people. So you are not blaming black people or you're not saying that black people are not doing enough because there are millions, thousands, hundreds of thousands of freedom fighters. Where are they now? They've been mm. killed by the West. There yeah. are thousands of names, you know, even unknown names that are being killed and slaughtered by the West for standing up against their oppressor. So it's not enough to say Africans are not doing enough because Africans have been doing enough before the white man even existed. And that's just the problem, you know? So yeah. one thing, of course, black people need to rethink the way they look at white people. Absolutely. But white people, first of all, need to tell black people that, yes, we made that mistake. We whitewashed your history. And we mm. are going to correct it. And we are going to give those books and the pencil to you. And you write your history. And you teach us what you know before we even exist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and I'll mention, uh, you know, one last thing before I go, because, I mean, people are asking, what's the action plan over here? And I think uh, here's the issue, right? Unfortunately, you know, we had, we had two groups after independence. So we had the Casablanca countries and we had the Monrovia countries. The Casablanca countries, right? We had people like uh, the leader of Algeria, for example, Bomidien, right? Very, very, very charismatic, very fiery, he wanted change, right? We have people like him, right? Who he was a native too. Yeah, sorry? He was a native too. Yeah, exactly. Like he was someone who actually said that we want change, right? And then I need you guys to all look at this. Like, look, there was a group called OPEC, right? It was a, it was a cartel, essentially they call it a cartel. I don't know why, right? But like, it's a group of nations that were producing oil and they included some Arab countries, some Latin American countries. And then there was also non-OPEC countries that were, that were African countries. The, we're going to call them non-industrialized countries. Right? So the African countries, and these countries came together. They went to the UN. right? And you guys, this is, I can't believe, out of all the things that we've learned in our school, this is one thing I don't know why we did not learn it. They went to the UN and they fought for us. Right? They said that this, this thing that you're trying to do, right, especially the West, the way you're controlling the currencies, the way you're controlling the knowledge, all these different things, we don't want to deal with it anymore. In fact, the OPEC countries, they increased the fuel prices four times, right? And here's what scholars will tell you. Scholars will tell you it was in response to Israel's uh, invasion of Egypt, or like, you know, the, the 10 days war, I believe it was, right? But that wasn't necessarily the case. Right? They, were up, they were already preparing to up the fuel prices because they wanted to show the West, you think you're the one who can control the prices of our commodities? We will increase the prices ourselves. Right? We need to come together as countries that are subject to this new colonial state. We need to bring back that energy. Right? Otherwise, you, when you're fighting alone, you one leader it just gets taken out. Thomas Sankara was taken out. Right? Patrice Lumumba was taken out. All these different, those 22 African leaders 
that were killed. And I want you guys, and I'm, this is not even a conspiracy theory. If you guys think I'm like, go search this up, right? Even when Kwame Nkrumah was being overthrown from power, the US, if you look at that declassified CIA documentation, declassified, right? You can even find a BBC article on this. They knew that Kwame Nkrumah was going to be ousted. Yeah. They knew, but because they didn't want him in power, right? Because he was a leftist, what did they do? They did nothing. They're like, oh, how wonderful, right? They've taken care of him for us, right? Yeah. But if you did not comply, you became a target, just like Gaddafi. And that is what I meant to say, because somebody here said that uh, there, there were many black, uh, black revolts. Of course, I never said they were not. What I'm saying is by the instance I was given earlier about when someone comes to your house, we need to understand that colonization didn't happen uh, maybe in one year was one country, another year. There was no possibility for them to have known what is happening in other countries at the very same time because they went into Africa and invaded the whole of Africa at the same time. Yeah. Killing multiple thousands, millions of people at the same time. So they, of course, they were, they have been several freedom fighters, but where are they now? Because they, first of all, the West kept Africans divided. So if a freedom fighter was like you said, um, part of a leftist group and um, the, the concurrent or the opponent was another group. They were not like, oh, leave my brother alone. They will be lucky that the problem has been taken care of by yeah. the time, you know? So the division is what made those things possible. Dividing yeah. the black nation and Africa in general, um, telling them bullshit about each other, you know, dividing them like this is what played a huge part in being able to kill um, black leaders that fought for all black people, you know? So yeah. I never meant to say that there were not enough black revolutions. There were, but they even managed to label the Black Panther Party as terrorist attack while yeah. the KKK is burning crosses literally next to each other. This is not a matter of black people revolutions or black revolutions. It's a matter of white problems. Yeah. Know? So black yeah, no. people can, can be revolutionaries from now till tomorrow. The system is not going to change if we don't stop our own people. We need to stop our own people from being bloody racist. Our country, mm. our government, our general society. You mm. know, this is not something I would never tell a black person, oh, go to Germany and tell these bloody racists that they are racist. Tell them to stop being racist. That's not a black person's responsibility. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for giving me this platform to be able to share. I'd like to thank you for taking your time and bringing this knowledge here. That's just amazing. No, thank I, you I so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you so much because I feel like there's so many different topics that we can, we can address. Um, uh, and just, you know, at the end of the day, you need to realize that these issues are systemic. Uh, and... Uh, I just I want to tell, just to put an image in people's mind before I before I go. I want you guys to really picture the first slave being brought to America, right? What they were thinking. They, from the moment they were put in shackles, they were already resisting. Yeah. And generations after that, the first slave to revolt, or the first group of slaves to revolt, right? When the enslaved people rose up against um, their masters. Right, and they, they, they essentially decided that this was this was the day we're going to get freedom. Many of them died, right? But they, because they sacrificed their lives, right? Because they sacrificed their lives and they sacrificed their time, their effort. The next generation got that inspiration. Then, after the colonial process came, they thought like this: Okay, you know what? Our ancestors have been able to fight. It is all these small wins. You may not live to see the, the fruits of the seeds that you've planted, but plant them anyways. And this is what we're doing. This is exactly what we're doing over here. And someone's just asked if uh, we can pin our names. So as usual, guys, just you can subscribe to me on my platforms if you want. I'm going Spire to tag Nations. your name below, even your YouTube channel. I'm going to tag everything in the comment section, definitely. Thank I'll you so much. As a comment. Thank you so much for taking your time. What a wonderful statement to end. We will plant this seed anyway. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank please. you so much and have a good night. All right. Thank you so Bye. much. See you.